I'm now giving between 30 and 40 percent of, of what I earn to charities. So I prefer Tolstoy to Dostoevsky. Certainly if you talk about abortion up to 20 weeks of pregnancy, there is no consciousness at all. They call it the impossible burger because people think it's impossible that this could not be meat. It tastes so much like meat. Yeah. Hi, this is a YouTube show for book lovers, book person, книжный чел in Russian. I'm Mastrida, and today here I'm with Peter Singer. Hi, Peter. Hi. You have been multiple times called one of the most influential or even the most influential philosopher of our time. What do you think is the role of philosophy today? I think philosophy should help people to think clearly but it should also help people to think clearly about important issues that face us. So I don't think it should be purely uh, academic for people in the university. I think we have to confront uh, particularly the ethical issues because ethics has always been an important part of philosophy. The, the ethical issues that face us in the 21st century in the kind of society that we're living in with the particular problems that we have. What are the most important ones? Well, I think... Uh, the existence of extreme poverty, uh, hundreds of millions of people living without really enough to meet their basic needs uh, in a world in which there is also a great deal of affluence. Uh, that is one very important problem. Um, I have also been interested for a long time in the way we treat animals. And although many people think this is not such an important problem, when you consider that there are something like 70 billion animals raised and killed for food each year, if we are inflicting unnecessary suffering on those animals, then that is a big problem. And thirdly, of course, I think we can't escape the fact that we are changing the climate of our planet, and that is a huge global problem. I think we'll discuss all of those problems. Let's start with the first one, uh, global poverty, and I'd like to start by discussing effective altruism. I'm sure that uh, this is uh, the most important topic uh, that we could share with our viewers today. And first of all, let's start with some elevator pitch of effective altruism. Could you please explain what it is in brief for those that don't know about it? So effective altruism, firstly, is clearly uh, altruism. That is, it's the idea that one of our goals should be to do good generally, to make the world a better place, not necessarily that that's the only thing we can do, that's too saintly, but that that should be an important part of our lives. And secondly, that whatever resources we are going to put towards this, whether it's money or time or skills or energy, we should try to get the best value out of that. So we should try to do the most good that we can, not just to say I'm doing some good, but saying am I doing the most good that I could with the resources that I'm putting into trying to make the world a better place. But sometimes you choose not between two good things, but between an evil and less evil thing, right? Well, of course people do, but um, I'm... Like in the trolley problem. Yes, so sometimes we're in situations, so that's what you're saying, that we, we don't have any other choice, right? We, we can only choose between something that is very bad or something that is still bad but less bad. That may be a a situation that we're in, unfortunately, and then, yes, we should choose, choose to do the least harm that we can. Because now we have, for example, the problem of animal rights, the problem of starving people, children in Africa, and we cannot save everybody. So we have to decide what is more important and, so to say, sacrifice some other things. Well, we can certainly uh, do what we can to avoid there being a conflict between the interests of uh, starving people in Africa or wherever they might be and uh, the interests of animals in, in not suffering. So I think we have to try to find solutions that produce a reasonable harmony in the interests of animals and humans wherever we can. But I agree, in the end, sometimes it's not going to be possible. And then we have to decide you know, how much animal suffering are we prepared to accept in order to prevent some human suffering. Um, and I don't 
accept the view that humans always take priority over animals. I think it does depend on how much suffering we're going to be inflicting on animals as compared to what humans will suffer. How do you measure this? Well, it's very difficult to measure this. Um, but you know, sometimes we can make rough comparisons, I think, to, to take, for example, large numbers of animals and confine them in factory farms where they are suffering for their whole lives, for the months, weeks, months, whatever it might be that they live in these farms, just so that some humans can uh, enjoy a particular kind of food when, when they could still nourish themselves from some other food. Um, I think it's clear that the animal suffering then outweighs the interests of the humans in having this particular kind of meal. But if the humans were going to starve to death without uh, killing the animals and eating them, then certainly I think it's justifiable to kill and eat the animals. The best subscription-based audiobook service Storytel is our sponsor. You can find dozens of thousands of audiobooks there in English, in Russian, in many other languages. I use it on a daily basis. I listen to audiobooks while jogging, while cooking, while washing the dishes, while sleeping in my bed. And I recommend you do the same. Many classical titles, many classical philosophical titles that we discussed with Peter Singer are on Storytel. Click the link below in the description of the video and you get one month free subscription to Storytel. Try it out, you're gonna like it. Storytel, Knižny Chel. Uh, we have most viewers in Russia and um, I think that uh, many of them are now thinking uh, how, how can uh, Peter um, say that animal rights are so important when there are dozens of millions people dying every year because of uh, things that we could have prevented because of poverty, because of disease, etc., etc. And in the world, there is not enough money in, in uh, charities to save both people and animals. Well, it's, it's certainly true that uh, there are people in, in great need. But in fact, uh, what we're doing to animals doesn't help them at all. It actually harms them. Because when we put animals inside factory farms, we have to grow food to feed to the animals. They can't, they're not eating grass, of course. So we have to grow grain or soybeans to feed them. And in the process just of living and of keeping warm and of putting on you know, bones that we can't eat anyway, they waste most of the food value. So in fact, there would be much more food in the world if we stopped at least the intensive confinement of animals. Uh, and that's where most of the animals we're raising for food today are. They're indoors, they're not in the fields. So it's really harming people who are poor rather than helping them. I agree with you and uh, I know that you are advocating uh, veganism or at least vegetarianism, but most people, even if they understand that uh, killing and eating animals is not uh, morally good, they still do it for various reasons. They say, I'm used to it, I like, uh, I like such food, etc., etc. How to change the mentality of people? Well, it's very difficult to change people's habits in this area, but um, I would suggest, you know, if you can't face the idea of, of really going vegan or vegetarian, uh, then reduce the amount of meat you're eating. That will help as well, because there will be less animal suffering. If everybody you know, didn't eat meat one day a week, that would already help. Uh, you know, and that used to be a Christian tradition, uh, not to eat meat on Fridays. Um, so uh, even if you do it just one day a week, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Or if you try to avoid buying animal products from factory farms, you look for the more organic products from animals able to walk around freely. Um, it may be more expensive, but you can eat less of it um, and just regard it as a special treat to have occasionally. And in that way, you can still not give up meat entirely or not give up animal products entirely, but you can be healthy and you can feel that you're contributing something to uh, reduce animal suffering. Do you think the situation will change when artificial meat becomes uh, less expensive? I think it will. I think that we may actually see a dramatic transformation uh, once we can produce uh, products that either really are meat at 
because they're grown in, at the cellular level from uh, the cells of animals, so they, they really are meat, or if we can produce meat-like products from plants, which is, is already happening on quite a large scale. So, for example, the American burger chain Burger King already has um, plant-based burgers in uh, its... Uh, impossible burgers, something like right. that. That's right, they're called the impossible burger because people think it's impossible that this could not be meat. It tastes so much like meat. Yeah, I've tried one. It's, it's really tasty. It uh, I've really tried them too, yes. I mean, it's a long time since I've eaten burgers from meat, but I must say that uh, it does remind me as far as I can remember what those burgers were like. Do you think that future generations will look down on us uh, eating meat uh, on such a global scale, killing animals, and say that these were the barbaric times? Yes, I, I really believe that is possible. Uh, it may take a, a while, but you know, think about how we now look back on the Roman Empire and uh, the games that people you know, gathered in the Colosseum and they, they watched uh, lions fighting with uh, prisoners or something like that, and we now think of that as completely barbaric. Uh, maybe one, one day people will look back and say, how could they have been so ethically blind as to treat animals in the way that we are treating them today? Let's return to effective altruism. Um, basically, if I'm not uh, wrong, effective altruism is about saving uh, more people or animals or whomever uh, if you can. So if you can save five people instead of one person, you, you'd better save five. Uh, here's the question. How can, you, how can you make such judgments? In some cases, for example, there is one Elon Musk, I don't know, uh, some person that will save the world, change the world, and you sacrifice his or her life uh, instead of uh, more numbers. How can you make such judgments which are mathematical about such things as human lives which are of utmost importance for many people? Well, um, I think when, when philosophers discuss this situation of whether you should save five people rather than one, they're assuming that you don't know anything about the people. So, um, sure, it's possible that the one is some great person who is going to discover a cure for cancer, but it's more likely that among those five, one of them will be the great person who will discover the cure for cancer. Because, after all, there's five of them, so there's five times the chance if you don't know anything. And so, well, you know, what, what I'm saying is, if you don't know anything about the people, you should certainly save the largest number. What if you do? If you do, then it's a different calculation, uh, sure. And you know, if you find that uh, the five are, are terrible people who are doing bad things uh, and the one is a good person or at least is not harming anybody, um, then perhaps you should save the one. Well, that's a bold statement. Many people would disagree. How can you measure humans' lives against each other? Uh, you can look at what effect they're having on the world, right? And you may know that uh, some people are uh, vicious, sadistic, uh, you know, they try what they can to harm other people. Maybe they have long criminal records of, of violent crime. Um, and other people are trying to do some good in the world. So I think we should give preference to those who are doing good if it comes to that sort of choice. Okay, um, I have a question regarding Uh, effective altruism. Mm, I have read that uh, an important notion in it is the well-being of future generations. So uh, many effective altruists say that we should uh, invest in charities that uh, help prevent existential risks that the humanity is facing. For example, AI safety risk or the risk of uh, nuclear war, etc., etc. How much value do you put on the well-being of such future generations? And uh, should we invest more in such charities rather than charities that help people living now? There's certainly a, a discussion among effective altruists about these issues. And I think it's, it's good that there should be a discussion and that some people will say we should pay more attention to the long-term future and to the risk that our species may become extinct, because I do think that would be uh, a tragedy if, if our species were to become extinct. Um, but uh, obviously the chances of these things happening are also relatively small, so we have to take into account uh, what the odds are, whereas you know, if we help people who are in great need, who 
don't have any health care, for example, in some part of the world and we save their lives, we can have a high confidence that we will help them. So um, it's difficult to decide between this small probability of uh, us becoming extinct and trying to do something about that and the high probability that we can help concrete people. How do you measure it? Uh, so ideally, if you knew all the facts, you would try to say uh, how many people we're going to help in one way and how many the other. But there is a, a more difficult philosophical question, and that is uh, when you consider the risk of extinction, do you think of this as the loss of the 7.6 billion people we have on the planet today? Or do you think it of the loss of all of future the possible generations. future generations who don't even exist and, and who will never exist if we become extinct? And some, some philosophers think we should count everybody equally, if you like, the, the future ones as well as the present ones. And others think, no, the ones who will never exist because our species becomes extinct will also never lose anything, right? <laughs> They'll never miss anything because simply they never exist. So there is a quite complicated debate going on among philosophers uh, about this question. So it's like abortion? Uh, well, some in some ways it's like abortion, but uh, people who are opposed to abortion would say it's not quite the same because you do have the embryo or the fetus. It exists in a more concrete way. Um, but I, I tend to agree because I, I, I think, it, if you, certainly if you talk about abortion up to 20 weeks of pregnancy, there is no consciousness at all uh, up to that point. So in that sense, I think it's, yes, those are similar questions. It's, it's the potential that is lost, not the actual conscious being who is destroyed. So if you think that there is a risk of 1%, for example, Uh, that uh, could destroy our human race and uh, make it so that all future generations will not be born. Um, and uh, this risk is underfinanced. Shouldn't we take money from uh, funds that help current generations to invest in uh, those, preventing those existential risks? It, it's not enough to know that the risk is 1%. We also need to know how likely it is that we will be able to reduce that risk by diverting money now. So in some cases, maybe we can. So for example, I think the clearest case would be the, the, the risk to, of extinction that a large asteroid may collide with Earth and cause a kind of such a catastrophic collision that it wipes out life on Earth. So that's a very small probability but we can track large asteroids. In fact, the United States uh, uh, NASA, the Space Authority, is, is actually doing that. And we could possibly build a rocket uh, with an explosive warhead that would deflect them slightly, just change their path by a small amount, so they would miss our planet. So there's a case where you could say we could form a reasonable estimate of how we could reduce the risk by spending some money. And I think if the risk were 1%, that would definitely be worth doing. But in some of these cases, like you mentioned, the speculation that we will develop artificial intelligence to such a point that it will become smarter than us and will maybe destroy us. Um, it's hard, firstly, to know how likely this is, and secondly, it's hard to know how we, with our present state of knowledge, could prevent that. Because you know, we're, we're, everybody would agree we're several decades away from this if it's going to happen at all. So it, Maybe we don't even know in what way it will develop and therefore in what way to prevent it. So I think that for risks like that, we don't know enough about how, how, what useful work we can do to prevent it, to divert any funds from the existing charities that we do know what to do. So you think it's not worth investing in such uh, organizations? I don't think it's worth investing on a large scale. I'm happy that there are some people thinking about it now. Like Eliezer Yudkovsky and... Yes, uh, his, yes, there are a few people thinking team. about it, and that's good. I think that's fine. And I, you know, if some people want to donate to support that work, excellent. But I don't think that on a large scale we should divert um, you know, billions of dollars towards reducing existential risk today. I think there are better things with a better payoff, that better expected value, uh, altruistic... Effective altruists talk about the expected value, that is the value discounted by the odds against achieving it. So I think there are things with higher expected value today. 
Okay, let's return to uh, more day-to-day uh, obvious uh, charity causes. You advocate for foreign aid actively. In Russia, um, the culture of foreign aid is not developed. And many people say that we should first help our own citizens, our own nation. Of course, we face many problems and there is a lot of poverty in Russia, etc., etc. Although it's not as staggeringly horrible as in Africa, for example. Um, do you think we should concentrate on our own country or do you think that Russians as well should develop the culture of foreign aid? Uh, to some extent, I, I would say both, right? Um, so I do accept that in Russia you have more people living in, in real extreme poverty than in the countries that I am more used to speaking in and living in, like the United States, like Australia, like the United Kingdom and uh, other countries in Western and Central Europe. Um, so I think it's reasonable for Russians to say, uh, let's focus on helping the people who are really at the bottom in Russia, who are really poor, um, and try to also persuade the government to do more because you know, this is something we can try to advocate, that the government should do more to help people in real poverty in, in Russia. But at the same time, I think it would be good for Russia to pay more attention to people in poverty elsewhere in the world, um, to develop greater knowledge and expertise in that area. And eventually when uh, you know, the problems of extreme poverty in Russia are overcome, as I hope they will be in the foreseeable future, then to shift more of the resources towards helping extreme po poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. In Russia, there is another problem, um, a stereotype that it is noble and good to do good things without public announcements, without the hype. Uh, Leo Tolstoy wrote, do good in secret and feel sorry when somebody learns about it. And then you will learn the joy of doing good. How to overcome this stereotype? How to make philanthropy a social norm in Russia? Yes, I, I, you're right. It's important to overcome that idea. And it's important for people to understand that if you keep secret about your philanthropy, then it doesn't become a cultural norm. Um, because you know, we know from studies of human psychology that you know, we are to some extent like sheep. We, we do what other people do. We, we follow them. And many people will say to themselves, well, you know, I don't know anybody who really gives a significant portion of their income to charity, um, so why should I do it? Uh, but if the people who do it speak about it publicly um, and develop a community of people who are doing this, then I think it's easier for more people to join in. Uh, and that's why um, the organization that I've founded, The Life You Can Save, um, has a pledge on, online that you can go to and you can pledge to give a percentage of your income to charity so that then other people can know about this. Uh, and Bill and Melinda Gates started a, a special giving pledge for billionaires to pledge to give at least half of their wealth away um, before they die. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of moves now to try to encourage people to be more public about their giving because people recognize that that will lead to more giving. Let's be more practical. Um, here is Russia, with only 3% of the population actively participating in charitable activities, which is much uh, fewer than even uh, many poor countries. Like I know that in uh, Myanmar, 97% uh, actively participate in uh, charity, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, I think, less rich than Russia. Yes. Yes. So it's not only about the money and the well-being, but about the culture. How to change it? You have been to Russia not, not No, but for you a can't ask time. me. I, yes, exactly. I, I've been to Russia for two or three days. I mean, but I what's your impression? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I assume that Russians are basically like other people, that um, they are influenced by what people in their communities do. And so I think we need to try to develop a, a critical mass of people who are open about their giving um, and will encourage more giving. Um, I think we 
also need, you know, the, 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 one of the major reasons people all over the world say, I don't give if they don't give, is I don't trust the charities. You know, they say, how do I know the money will get to the people who really need yes. it? So I think we need to make people aware that there are now independent evaluating organizations that exist only to evaluate charities and to recommend the most effective charities where you can be extremely confident that if you make a donation, the money will be used to do a lot of good, let's say, for people in, who would otherwise get malaria, children who might die from malaria, or you know, many other causes like this. Uh, like GiveWell. Yes, GiveWell is, is one of these organizations that does this evaluation. Uh, there are others, and uh, uh, The Life You Can Save also recommends particular charities that have been evaluated by other evaluators. So, so yes, you, people can go online to givewell.org or thelifeyoucansave.org. Now, these may not be particularly Russian charities, but um, there, there are charities. And I, in I Russia, would, I would recommend visiting the website Taki Dila, link in description below, and uh, of course, uh, watch uh, my interview with Mitya Alishkovsky, Knizhny Chel, in Russian. Uh, he talks about various charities that are worth donating to. Yeah, I'm sure, and that's what we need to encourage those organizations in Russia that will provide people with confidence that uh, their donation will really do good. So, first of all, more people should be open about donating. Second of all, uh, we should encourage transparency in uh, charitable organizations that people know that their money is spent well. Right. What else? Well, I think we can use the internet also to create a, a connection between the donor and uh, not the individual recipient, but perhaps the communities. So, for example, if you're giving to an organization that is providing bed nets against uh, malaria carrying mosquitoes, you can't actually have a connection with the life you save because you don't know which child would have died from malaria or without the bed net. But you can develop a connection maybe with the village or the region. I, I think we should be using the internet more to, to bring people together, you know, to make the world more connected. In your book, uh, The Life You Can Save, you write about a case when Metropolitan Museum paid $45 million dollars for a painting of Madonna Madonna Duccia, yeah. um, and you say that, what a pity, those money could be spent on saving the lives of many hundreds and even thousands of people, uh, or treating them, uh, making them see again, for example, bl blind people. But many people would counter this by saying that, so you don't uh, approve of arts, of anything that doesn't help the children in Africa, for example? Well, it's not that I don't approve of art, but um, you know, I, I think that the amount of, that we spend on art is, is really out of proportion. And obviously, this is a, a fine painting of many hundreds of years old. But you know, if, if it had not been bought by the Metropolitan Museum in New York, it wasn't going to be left out in the rain anyway, right? Somebody w was going to protect it and value it and keep it. Um, so really, what the money was spent for was to get this painting here so that New Yorkers or visitors to New York could see it. And I don't think that that's a particular value. Um, uh, and I do think that we, we overvalue uh, works of art. I mean, since I wrote that, obviously, even more has been spent on paintings by museums and sometimes by individuals, like the Leonardo uh, Salvatore Mundi that was sold, I think, for a hundred million or something like that. Um, I think that this is uh, an excessive valuation given the other things, uh, again, as you say, that this amount of money could do. And I, I would say to those people, you know, if you think uh, art is more important than, for example, being able to see, imagine that you were the person who could not see, or imagine that you know, your child uh, was even at risk of becoming blind. How much would you pay to prevent your child becoming blind? Um, and then think of the thousands of people who could have cheaply had their sight restored. Because in poor countries, there are people who just have cataracts and they cannot see. And you know, it costs maybe $50 to remove a cataract. So uh, this is a lot of people that uh, $45 or $100 million dollars could have uh, restored sight to. There is another stereotype that only rich people, only people like Bill and Melinda Gates or Warren Buffett 
can make a difference and uh, be effective altruists. I know that you yourself have uh, pledged to donate a part of your income. By I'm Blue now Hub. giving between uh, 30 so and 40%. I mean, the pledge that I've taken was 10%, charities. but... So uh, I know that you advocate uh, for ordinary middle-class people to participate in charity. Can you please describe uh, which effects could that have on a global scale? Well, the point is that you know, for every Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates, there are so many uh, ordinary middle-class people and they don't have to give very much. Um, if, <clears throat> if they were to give uh, 1% of their income, then uh, that would make a, a huge difference if, if everybody who is let's say, middle class, you know, people who have enough to live on and they can still afford to do things like, you know, go to the movies or occasionally go out to a restaurant or something like that. Um, they could usually afford to give 1% of their income without any real great hardship. And so because there's so many of those people, that could also make a huge difference and add up to more than Bill Gates can give. We are a show about books and literature. And uh, I ask all our guests to tell us about his or her favorite books that influenced him or her and uh, that he or she recommends to our audience. Mm -hmm. Which books would you name? Okay, so, I mean, uh, in terms of books to recommend to a general audience, um, I've been influenced um, by books in philosophy, clearly, but... Uh, Some of those are not really popular reading. Um, I would like people to uh, think about ethics more generally. Um, uh, so of the classic books, I, I recommend John Stuart Mill as a utilitarian. I don't think he's the greatest philosopher, but he's a good writer, um, and uh, so he's quite readable. So John Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism, uh, or his essay on liberty uh, about freedom of expression and freedom of thought. I think is uh, perhaps his best work. Uh, so I certainly would recommend that, and perhaps here in Russia it's a book that could be read rather more. Um, so otherwise, uh, recent uh, sort of non nonfiction books, um, I find a lot of encouragement in a book by Steven Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, it's an antidote to the idea that somehow everything is getting worse. And Pinker argues that no, Uh, we are making progress. The amount of poverty in the world is falling. The number of people who can't read or write is falling. The number of children who die uh, from preventable diseases is falling. So it's a more optimistic uh, book. So that's another one I would uh, strongly recommend. Do you read fiction? I read some fiction, yes. Um, I, uh, you know, if you want to work, my favorite fiction is really... Uh, 19th century uh, English fiction. I think uh, Jane Austen is a wonderful writer. I have no idea how well she translates into Russian. Um, quite well. Quite well, good. And uh, George Eliot, Middlemarch, is a, a, a wonderful 19th century novel, I think. Um, so yes, uh, I would certainly recommend those. Um, and there are, uh, there are you know, somewhat more recent ones of sort of Still living writers, I like uh, A.S. Byatt uh, as a writer, and particularly her novel Possession. Um, it's one of my one of the novels that I've enjoyed. What about Russian literature? Uh, so I prefer Tolstoy to Dostoevsky. Um, maybe you would realize that, given my general ethical leanings. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, probably. I know there was more recent uh, Russian literature, but I haven't kept up with uh, a lot of the recent stuff. You prefer Tolstoy because you are not religious or because of what? Um, not just that I'm not religious, um, but also uh, because Dostoevsky has this um, very deontological view, it seems. Uh, you know, there's this famous question uh, in the Karamazov brothers that... Uh, Uh, Ivan asks Alyosha about the, the child, right? Here's this, you, you could create the perfect world, everybody would be happy forever after, there would be no more wars, no more torture, no more violence. And a crying but, child. But first you have to tor torture this crying child, right? So I think the answer is, if you really imagine yes, you, that situation, yes, you right? Of course, it, it can't happen, right? We, there is no way you create peace on earth forever by torturing a child, it's, it's the reverse. But if, that really were going to happen, 
you should torture the child. We have a contest. Um, here's Peter Singer's book, The Life You Can Save, in Russian, Jin, Kotori Vy Morsti Spasti. And uh, it's gonna be a gift to one of our subscribers who lets in the comments below the most interesting comment in the section of like Bunin. Like Bunin is our traditional section in which we ask people to describe like Bunin once did in a brief and maybe in some sarcastic manner, describe one important figure of his or her time. Please describe who is Mr. Singer, like Bunin. And the best comment, the author of the best comment will have this book with the autograph by Peter Singer. And our partners and friends from Nuzna Pomash Fund are given a promo code for 10% discount. Promo code must reader. Link below. You can buy this book with a discount. Please read it. It is amazing. I think that uh, Peter Singer's books, he didn't uh, say anything about them modestly, but they are truly must reads. The Life You Can Save is a short, uh, important uh, uh, summary of statements on effective altruism and practical ethics is. Uh, one of the most important philosophical works of our time. Thank you, Mr. Singer. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you. Knižni čel.